Amen. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's good to see you again. Let's uh, jump back into the Great Commission and think about it. Um, There's a lot of confusion out there about what missions is. Um, You may get support letters from kids, grandkids, relatives, going on short-term trips, engaging in a whole number of different kinds of activities, um, all for Jesus. And uh, it seems like everything is missions anymore. And if everything is missions, then what? Nothing is missions. And so, um, thankfully, we are not left in the dark. We actually have um, a whole book. Actually, we have two books given to us together, companion volumes, that really tell us exactly what the Great Commission and the work of the Great Commission is. And so, what I want to do is I want to introduce to you tonight... Um, really what it looked like to flesh out the idea in Matthew 28 of go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them um, to observe all that I commanded. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to do that by looking at the book of Acts primarily. But if we're going to start with the book of Acts and just kind of get caught up with what the book of Acts is all about, that means you actually have to start at Luke chapter 1. So what I want to do is I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1 and then also be ready to go to Acts chapter 1. And I promise this is going to be the best three hours of your life that you've... I'm kidding. I know you're ready. You'd like to say, please do it. Um, So you you can't introduce Acts without Luke. And you can't talk really about Luke, the Gospel of Luke, without Acts. They're companion volumes written by the same author. We don't have time to go into um, the way that we think that Luke is the author because it's not expressly stated that he is. But Luke was Paul's traveling companion in the book of Acts. There's many sections in the book of Acts where all of a sudden the writer starts saying, we went on the ship, and that means that the author was with them, and we believe that was Luke. Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician in Colossians 4. He was probably Paul's personal physician traveling with him. And Luke is writing these two volumes to his acquaintance, a man named Theophilus who is some kind of a Roman official or Roman dignitary. Um, He carries the title Most Excellent. He refers to him as Most Excellent Theophilus. Let's take a look at Luke 1, 1 1-4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us, It seemed fitting for me as well, Luke says, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty about the things you have been taught. Now, my opinion is Theophilus is a Roman official, a governing official of some sort, and I believe he has become a Christian. I think Luke is using the language here of the Great Commission, you have been taught these things. Not just that you heard about them as a, as a governing official, but a governing official has become a disciple of Jesus Christ, and he is being taught the things that Jesus said to keep. And so Luke is writing to him. Now switch over to Acts chapter 1, and then we'll just be in Acts from here forward. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Luke says, The first account, O Theophilus, I composed. And what did he compose it about? It was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, Luke was just the beginning. The Gospel of Luke was just the beginning of what Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. Appearing to them over 40 days and speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. So what is fascinating is Luke and Acts put together actually occupy 30% of your New Testament. And Luke is the only Gentile author of any scripture we have. And so 30% of your New Testament is written to a Roman governing official. God wanted 
30% of the New Testament to be written to governing authorities that they would understand who Jesus Christ was, what happened to him in his life, what he taught, that he died, that he was raised from the dead, that he ascended on high, and his witnesses are going across the land. Governing officials know this. I got 30% of the New Testament for you to see that. That's what's going on. Governments have a two-volume account of the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and great commission of Jesus Christ. That's pretty interesting. Luke most likely finished his research writing these two volume, uh, this two-volume account at the time that Paul was imprisoned uh, in Rome at the end of Acts 28. If you remember, before Paul's in prison in Rome, he's in prison in Caesarea for two years. So while he's in prison, Luke is probably traveling all around Palestine, getting research, maybe talking even to Mary. How else would he get the account of what happened when he was 12, going to the temple? And so then he did all of his research and then they have the shipwreck and they finally get to Rome and then he finishes writing it. And so that puts the writing of Luke and Acts, in my opinion, at A.D. 60, 61. Here's what one commentator said about these two volumes. They are not merely two independent writings from the same pen. They are single continuous. Acts is neither an appendix nor an afterthought it is an integral part of Luke's original plan and purpose for writing. And so, uh, you, the order in which things are laid, God did what he did. And I'm not going to take any issue with what God did in the order of things. But 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians go together. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians go together. And 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy go together. And in my opinion, I think Luke and Acts should be put together. But that's some, something we can talk about at another time. And that kind of gets us then to the purpose of this letter. There are many multiple layered purposes of Acts uh, that exist. But there's a main one, I think. And the main one is to show this. The main purpose of the book of Acts is to show how the gospel and the church expanded across the Roman Empire within just 30 short years. Think about what Luke has provided for us in these two volumes. If you put the two time periods, the life of Jesus from birth to his death and then the next 30 years, we have 60 years from the birth of Jesus Christ to Paul being in prison in Rome and released. That's what we have in these two volumes. Is there an outline for this book? It's actually detailed for you in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Just drop down a few verses. Look at uh, verse 8. Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus says to his apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And here's the way the book falls out. Both in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and Samaria and then even to the end of the earth. So in Acts chapter 1 through 7, you get the detail of the witnesses of the resurrected Jesus Christ preaching the gospel, and planting the church in Jerusalem. And then in chapters 8 through 12, you get um, how the, the witnesses of Jesus Christ were scattered because of Stephen's persecution, and they ran with the gospel into Samaria. And they took the gospel and the church there. And then from Acts chapter 13 all the way to chapter 28, you get exclusive focus on Paul, who is the apostle of the Gentiles, who takes the gospel on its way to the end of the earth. And there's your outline of the book of Acts, spelled out by Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And so if that's kind of your introductory background material, now let's kind of focus to the main meat of what we want to talk about tonight. I want to give you from the book of Acts, I want to give you five keys to the book of Acts, okay? And I'll give them to you up front. Here are the five keys to the book of Acts. It begins first that there are key leaders. There are key leaders in the book of Acts. And those key leaders, secondly, supply the key message. The key message. And they give that key message to the key servants. And those key servants carry out the key activity, which then results in, lastly, number five, the key outcome. 
So there's a key leader, key leaders, with a key message given to the key servants who carry out the key activity and it results in the key outcome. Now let's just walk through those and you'll see this is the Great Commission. Okay? Who are the key leaders? Well, obviously, the key leaders um, are the Son of God, the Spirit of God, and God the Father. Um, let's talk about Jesus Christ first. If you look in chapter 1, verse 1 again, I, I compose this about all that Jesus began to do. The title of this is called the Acts of the Apostles. You know, that's not inspired. That's not a part of the inspired text. That's what the church labeled it later. It's, it, it might be more accurate to say these are the Acts of Jesus Christ. Because what he began to do in Luke is now being spelled out even more of what he's doing in Acts. God the Son. He's the vindicated Messiah who gained that ultimate position of authoritative advantage that we talked about. Death could not hold him. He burst forth from the grave. And Acts picks up with his ascension into heaven. Chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. Look at it with me. And after he had said these things, Jesus was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received Jesus out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, and while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come just in, the, in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So from heaven, that is where Jesus is acting. That is where he is doing. That is where he is achieving the next stage of his great work which runs all the way up until the time he comes back with his kingdom. Another key leader is God the Holy Spirit. He is mentioned in the book of Acts 57 times or so. 57 times in 28 chapters. He is poured out, as you know, on those who believed in in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, he guides the advancement of the gospel. He takes Philip and moves Philip wherever Philip needs to be. In Acts chapter 13 at the church in Antioch of Syria, he says to the church leaders there, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. In Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit forbids the gospel to go into Asia, and then he forbids it to go into Bithynia, but then he moves Paul and Silas across the water over into the continent of Europe and Macedonia, and they go to Philippi. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned 57 times. He is a key leader, and you'll see more of this in a little bit here. And then obviously God the Father is the third key leader. Now watch in Acts chapter 2 verse 33. Watch this. Turn to Acts 2, 33. Here, watch this triune transaction taking place. Acts chapter 2 verse 33. Peter is preaching at Pentecost and he says this in verse 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God... And having received from the Father, there's God the Father, he received, Jesus received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, just full stop. Just think about that. God the Son receives from God the Father, God the Spirit. And Jesus poured out God the Spirit that he received from God the Father. That's what starts this whole thing off. That's the, the, those are the key leaders. Without this happening, without God the Father giving God the Spirit to God the Son, so God the Son can pour out God the Spirit on his apostles, this great commission goes nowhere. See, this is all about God. This is all about what he is capable of. It doesn't matter what your disadvantages are. It doesn't matter what your deficits are. That doesn't mean anybody should just go. Okay? Hear me, hear me fully on this. You need to be well trained. You need to be really well equipped. You need to be godly in your character. You need to be above reproach. But you're still going to have deficits. Massive ones. But this is about the key leaders. God the Father. God the Spirit. God the Son carrying out an amazing great commission through his servants. Alright, so there's number one. The key leaders. And these key leaders... What is this key message, number two, that is supplied by the key leaders? And you know what the message is. It is the gospel. It is the gospel. And the word gospel means what? 
good news. That's right, good news. And I want you to listen to the wonderful variety of ways that good news was preached and applied by the apostles. Now we're just going to do a little survey through Acts, all right? Turn to Acts chapter 3, verse 26. I want you to see what good news, how good news was explained by the apostles. Chapter 3, verse 26. Listen to this good news. For you first... Jews in Jerusalem, Peter says, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you. That's good news. God raised up his servant, his son, to bless you. Well, how? By turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Do you want the good news of this blessing um, that is associated with resurrected Christ? Well, it comes through repentance. It comes through turning from your wicked ways. That means you need to understand you're a sinner. That means means you need to understand that you need to turn away from what you've made of yourself apart from Jesus Christ and your sin. And you need to turn from those wicked ways and you will have blessing. This is the good news of the gospel, is it not? Look at chapter 4, verse 12. Here's how the good news is described. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's good news. Notice how the verse begins. There is salvation. That's great news. Look at how it ends. How does the verse end? We must be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. And everything in between tells us it's exclusively found in Jesus Christ. There's, it, that salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we get this salvation. This is good news. Go to Acts chapter 10. By the way, that is all in Jerusalem. That's the good news in Jerusalem. Let's go to Acts chapter 10 verse 43. Now the gospel is in out among Gentiles for the first time with Peter. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Here's what Peter said to Cornelius with all who were gathered. Of him all, verse 43, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, through Jesus' name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Listen, this is the good news of how sure that uh, forgiveness is. Because this, listen, this is not what he said. He didn't say this. That through his name, almost everyone who believes receives forgiveness of sin. Almost everybody who does. It's really amazing that almost everyone who... That's not what he says. What does he say? Everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. That is how sure this forgiveness of sin is. It can be guaranteed. You believe, truly believe... And you receive forgiveness of sin. That's good news. Chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. Now the gospel is going out to Pisidian Antioch and to further Gentile regions. Acts 13, verse 38. Here's how good news is described and proclaimed. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers. Paul is in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. He says that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and, that's good news, we've already heard that, and here's more good news, and in him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified from through the law. Again, everyone who believes. This is how sure it is that you can receive a righteousness that is pleasing to God. It comes through faith. Every single person who believes gets that declaration of righteousness that you cannot get by trying to do works of the law. That is how certain a righteous status is for those who believe. Everyone who believes gets it. That's good news. Go to chapter 15, verse 11. This is the Jerusalem Council. They're back in Jerusalem. There's a big firestorm about what is the gospel. Does it include doing uh, works of the law? Or is it purely by grace alone, through faith alone? And here's what Peter says. Here's the good news. Peter says, But we Jews believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they, the Gentiles, also are. It's good news that must be believed that we are saved through the unmerited favor of Jesus Christ. That's good news. And it's for Jew and Gentile alike. That good news fits every man. Go to chapter 17, verse 3. Paul is now 
at Thessalonica in the province of Macedonia. Here's good news, chapter 17, verse 3, he's in the synagogue and Paul is explaining and setting before them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you, he's that Messiah in the Old Testament. This is good news. Christ had to suffer as the innocent substitute in your place and in my place. We do not have to suffer. He suffered in our place. Drop down to verse 30 and 31 of the same chapter. Acts 17, 30. Now he's in Athens talking to the really smart guys at the Areopagus. And he says this good news. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding men, commanding them, that everyone everywhere should repent. Well, why should they repent now? Well, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he determined having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. This is good news. And notice what, that he says, uh, he's commanding everyone everywhere to repent. When, you, when he says that he's commanding them, that means God has clarity on what is needed. He's not suggesting. He's not wondering if repentance is a good idea or not. He is commanding. This is how sure it is. And this is good news for us. We don't have to doubt about whether or not repentance is up for debate or not. It's not up for debate. If you want to be saved, you must repent. You must turn away from what you've made of yourself apart from God. And you must turn to Christ. And it's good news. And he furnished proof. Uh, He's fixed a day. And he's furnished proof. Uh, You know how like when Christmas is getting close and you want to help your kids see tangibly how far away it is, what do you make for them? You make a paper chain, right? And you can see the actual days. It makes it very tangible. This is God saying, "Um, I've got a paper chain for this day of judgment. And every day God just tears off another one. And every day he just tears off another one. And the next day comes and he tears off another one. Because that day of judgment is marked on his calendar. He fixed it. It's not some nebulous idea out there that might happen at some point in the future. Maybe your last time. I don't know. We don't know, but it's fixed. And it's coming. And God says right now to you, there's no doubt in my mind about what you need to do. I'm commanding you to repent. Come to my son and receive forgiveness of sins. Believe in him. He has grace for you. He's not asking you to do a good job and try to earn your own righteousness. He says, give that up and just come to my son. Everyone who believes is forgiven. That's good news. Acts chapter 26. Turn to Acts chapter 26. I love the book of Acts because you just get inundated with this message over and over everywhere you go. Acts 26 verse 18. Paul is before governor, which governor is he before? Agrippa and Festus, I believe. And he's giving his testimony. And he says that Jesus said this to him. I'm sending you, Paul, to open the Gentiles' eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. Listen, that's good news for you. You live, and if you live in the darkness of your rebellion against God, there's good news. Um, Your eyes can be opened to see that that's where you are, and you can come out from it to light. You can come out from being under the authority of Satan, verse 18, and come to God. This is good news. That you may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Drop down to verse 23, our last one we'll look at. Here's the good news. That Christ was to suffer. And that as the first of the resurrection from the dead, he was going to proclaim light both to Jewish people and to the Gentiles. This is good news that Christ suffered in your place. You do not have to suffer his wrath. All you have to do is turn away from your sin, believe Jesus Christ, and he will not cast you out. He won't. And there is your key message. 
And what is great about this good news being proclaimed across the pages of Acts is this, is that that message fits into every single different culture and worldview and language across the Mediterranean world. In a very Jewish place in Jerusalem, that was the message. When you got to the Samaritans, who were not anything like the Jews, and the Jews didn't want to be anything like them, that was the only message. When it went to the Greek idolaters in Lystra, who wanted to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were Zeus and Hermes, their gods, that was the message they proclaimed. When they went to Ephesus, and everybody was into magic and the occult, and they are burning their magic books, that was the message they preached. When Paul went to the philosophical center, where all the big heads and Athens gathered, there was only one message. It was only one good news that he preached. Whether Paul was before common people or whether he was before Roman governors and kings, there was one message. There was only one message for all of those settings. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified for forgiveness of sins. Repent and believe in him. Listen, what does that do for you? That gives you confidence. You don't have to learn 17 messages for 17 different contexts. It's one message. It's just one message. You have confidence as you're dealing with little children. You have confidence as you're dealing with classmates. You have confidence as you're dealing with parents. You have confidence as you're dealing with co-workers. You have confidence as you're dealing with tribal men and women. It doesn't matter where you are, there's one message. It's good news. That is the one and only message for any man. There is salvation. We must be saved. And there's salvation in no one else. No other name that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's no setting you will ever come across that will require you to alter that message Amen. or tweak it or abandon it for another one. Do you believe that? That's why Paul could say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Thirdly, key leaders... Number one, entrusted that key message of the gospel to key servants. Number three, key servants. Who are these key servants? We've got to go back to Acts chapter 1. Turn back there with me. These key servants were designated as witnesses. Witnesses. Well, witnesses of what in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts, you will find that they are witnesses primarily of resurrected Jesus Christ. The thing that they have seen and that has captivated them is Jesus is not dead. He's resurrected. He's alive from the dead. God the Son did not stay on earth and proclaim the message himself. He ascended into heaven. And he did not entrust the good news to an angel flying in mid-heaven to proclaim. But the key leaders entrusted their one and only key message to key servants who were specific eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus. The apostles were actual first-hand eyewitnesses. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. To these apostles that he had chosen, he presented himself alive after his suffering. And he did it by many convincing proofs, not by one not by two convincing proofs, but many convincing proofs. And not just one day did he do that, but he did that over a period of 40 days, speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. See, they saw this one who was raised from the dead. Now when you get to chapter 1, verse 21, and Jesus has ascended, they know they need to replace Judas. And so watch the way that they're thinking about themselves. Look at verse 21. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, that's chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, full stop. Let's just think about that for a moment. Peter is saying, and John are saying, um, from the day that Jesus was baptized with John the Baptist... And he started his public ministry. 
from that day until when we saw him go up through the clouds into the air, we need to find somebody who was with us for that whole time, and that one needs to become another witness with us. Verse 23, look at this. And they put forward how many men? That's all that were left of people who had been there from the beginning. There's only two men left. Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, or Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed, O Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and a lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven. Jump over to chapter 4, verse 20. Let me show you how they thought of themselves and how they were seen. Chapter 4, verse 20. Look what Peter and John said when they were threatened to stop speaking. We cannot stop speaking about what? What we have seen and what we have heard. We can't stop. We are captivated by what we have seen. Go to chapter 5, verse 29. Let me show you again one more. Again, they threatened them again, saying, if you keep speaking, you're going to be in worse trouble. Verse 29 of chapter 5, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. You see the emphasis on the resurrection, whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. This one God exalted to his right hand as a leader and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are what? We saw this. We know this. And so is the Holy Spirit as a witness whom God gave to those who obey. And in another way, all who believe end up becoming witnesses as well to the resurrected Christ in a different way. How can I summarize this idea of a key servant? Again, it is those who are captivated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that you? Captivated. If we're not captivated by the fact that his death wasn't final, then what could we say that would be believable to people? But he's not dead. God vindicated him. And if we're captivated by that message, it makes our message even more believable. Even when threatened with death. So, the key leaders entrusted the key message, number two, of the gospel to the key servants. Well, what were they supposed to do with that message? Were they supposed to act it out? Were they supposed to demonstrate the gospel? No, the key servants, number four, carried out the key activity, which was preaching, proclaiming, speaking, teaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. The verbal proclamation of the gospel is the key activity of the Great Commission. This is what they did. It's the preaching, it's the heralding of the good news, like a town crier coming and communicating the message from the king to the people. Hear ye, hear ye, listen to me. You must listen. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Peter preached again in the temple, Acts chapter 3. And now what I want to do is I want you to walk through with me one more time in the book of Acts. You're going to have it memorized by the time we're done. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, look at chapter 4, verse 1. This is Jerusalem. Peter and John and the apostles, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the bodyguard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly agitated. Why were they agitated? Well, because they were doing puppet shows. Uh, no, because they were teaching. I don't want to make fun of other things that can be done for children and, and others. That's, that could be, forgive me for that. But the point is, teaching, they're opening their mouths. Let there be no confusion in your mind about that, what missions is. It is opening your mouth and preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Look at verse 4. But many of those who had what? The message. They had to hear it. Faith comes from hearing. 
And hearing by the word or the message of Christ, they believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. Listen, preaching is a pretty effective thing. 5,000 people were saved. Drop down to verse 17. The religious authorities get them, threaten them, and they say, But lest it spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. What bothered the enemies of the gospel? The fact that it was being talked about, that it was being verbally proclaimed, that it was being spoken of. And when they, verse 18, had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 20, what did they say in response? We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, as they're praying later, and grant that your slaves may what? Speak your word with all confidence. Verse 31, when they had prayed earnestly, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they were began to do what? So listen, if you want to know what it meant in the book of Acts for them to be full of the Spirit, it is always associated with being bold with the gospel and preaching it. Okay? That's what was going on. They spoke the word of God with confidence. Go to chapter 5, verse 19. The apostles get thrown in jail. Verse 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison and taking them out, the angel said to them, go, stand, and what? Speak. Open your mouths again. I know you just got thrown into jail for speaking, but just go do it again. Just go do it again. And when an angel tells you to do that, you, go, you should go do that. Um, Look at verse 21. And upon hearing this, they entered the temple about daybreak and they began to teach. They didn't wait. The sun comes up and they're just teaching again. Go to verse 28. The religious authorities come again in the temple and they say, We strictly commanded you not to continue teaching. And yet you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. They don't even know what they're saying, do they? But Peter and the apostles answered, verse 29, and said, We must obey God rather than men. Drop down to verse 40. Gamaliel says, hey, I know what we should do. Just leave him alone. If it's of God, you can't stop this. And so they followed his advice. And after calling the apostles in and beating them, they again commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus. So they know what the problem is. The enemies know what they don't like. It's when we open our mouths. That's it. Have no confusion in your mind about what the main activity of of the Great Commission is. It is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. Mm -hmm. And so they went on their way, verse 41, from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease what? teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Listen, that's what they did in Jerusalem. Well, what about when you get to Samaritans? Is that what you should do with Samaritans too? Is that the key activity when you leave Jewish people? Well, go to chapter 8, verse 4. You know the persecution of Stephen hits and the Christians run for their lives out of Jerusalem. The apostles are probably the only ones who stayed in Jerusalem. Look at chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about, and what were they doing? Proclaiming or preaching the good news of the word. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he began what? Preaching. Verse 12, when they believed Philip, and what was Philip doing? Proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God. They were being baptized, both men and women. Verse 35, he is taken over to the Ethiopian eunuch. And look at this, 835, Philip opened his mouth. And beginning from this scripture, he proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. How big is his audience there, right there? One. You can preach to one person. Yes. Okay, you can, proclaiming is just proclaiming, just proclaim it. Verse 39, And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. I'm going to ask him about that. What was that like? And as he passed through, he kept doing what? Proclaiming the gospel to all the cities he came to. That's what you do in Samaria, is you 
engage in the key activity? What about when you are going on your way to the end of the earth? What did Paul do? Go to Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Are you convinced yet, by the way? 1338. Paul is in Pisidian Antioch on his first missionary journey, the Galatian region. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is what? Preached, proclaimed to you. When he gets to, again, Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, verse 3, you know what you can do? Is you can, as you read through the book of Acts, just look for words like this. Look for the word teaching, preaching, proclaiming, speaking. Um, look for those words, and every time you find it, just circle it. And you'll see it everywhere. It's everywhere. Chapter 17, verse 3, Paul is in a synagogue in Thessalonica, and he's explaining and setting before them that Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Chapter 26, verse 23, again, this is the same verse we looked at just a few moments ago. 26, 23, Paul is before Festus and King Agrippa, that Christ was to suffer and that as the first of the resurrection from the dead. Now this is interesting. It says he was going to proclaim light. That's Jesus. Jesus was going to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. How is it that Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father, is proclaiming light both to Jewish people and Gentiles? Jesus never went to the Gentiles. He's doing it through us. So Jesus Christ is proclaiming the gospel when we proclaim the gospel. That's what happens as the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. So what's the point? We have only one key activity to do, to engage in. The spirit-empowered proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, it's that simple. It's just that simple. That's all we do. That's all that Brian and Kara need to do in Medang. That's it. This is all Zach Can needs to do in the tribe is just proclaim the gospel. This is all you need to do with the little ones around your knees. This is all you need to do with your classmates. This is all you need to do with your professors. This is all you need to do with your coworkers. This is it. It's that simple and it's that powerful. It doesn't matter how the culture shifts around you. It doesn't matter how your children change, you know, when they're toddlers and it's simple and you can be really simple and clear and then they become these kind of willful elementary kid-like age and then they become teenagers and it's like, oh my goodness, what on earth? It doesn't matter how they change. There's only one activity that you do when they're little and when they're not so little and when they're ready to leave your home. There's just one message. There's one activity. Preach the gospel. Speak it. Teach it. Answer their difficult questions with it. So, The key leaders of the Godhead entrusted, number two, the key message of the gospel to, number three, the key servants who carried out, number four, the key activity with the gospel, they proclaimed it. What came from that? What came out from that across the pages of scripture? As you look through chapters one through seven in Jerusalem, what was the result of that? As you look at chapters eight through 12 out into Samaria, what was the result of that? As you look at chapters 13 to 28, as the gospel begins to go to the end of the earth, what was the result of that? What came forth from the preaching of the gospel is the church. The church, local church churches. What is the Great Commission? It is making disciples by proclaiming the gospel and planting churches. Gathering them into churches. The key expression in every city from Jerusalem to Samaria to Antioch of Syria to the island of Cyprus throughout the whole Galatian region to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Berea, to Athens, to Corinth, to Ephesus, and then to all of Asia, to Rome, and then at the end of Acts, we believe that Paul went, or yeah, at the end of Acts, after his release from prison in Rome, we believe he went to Spain, all the way to Spain. Then he sails back and he comes across the island of Crete with Titus. Everywhere he goes... Everywhere the gospel goes, the spirit-empowered preaching of the gospel by eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ resulted in churches. Churches. That's what this book shows you. 
think it can be called the church planting manual of the New Testament. This is what we do in missions. Let me give you just one example of how Paul did that. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Turn to Acts chapter 14, verse 21. I won't inundate you with a whole slew of passages again. I'll let you take this one at face value for the rest. Paul is on his first missionary journey. Verse 21 of chapter 14. After they had proclaimed the gospel, do you see it? They proclaimed it. That's the thing. That's the activity. To that city and made many disciples... See how that works? You proclaim the gospel, you make disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many afflictions we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every what? Church. Having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So that's what Paul did everywhere he went. He proclaimed the gospel. He made disciples. He discipled men to be elders. And he gathered them into local churches. And that's the Great Commission. That's missions. And with that, if you could walk away with one theme, really, from the book of Acts, it would be this theme. You can't stop the gospel. You can't stop the gospel from doing all of this. So just preach that gospel. Just preach it. The triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ is laid out in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. That reveals that victory track on which the triumphant gospel expanded and raced across the Mediterranean world in the first century from the capital city of the Jews in Jerusalem all the way to the capital city of the Roman Empire, the most powerful nation on earth. And the gospel was triumphant and it could not be stopped over those 30 years. The Mediterranean world saw the triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere it looked. Did it cost them dearly? Yeah. And it was victorious. The gospel was. With that, for if I could maybe make three short applications to your life on this and to mine as well, let me remind you of three important truths in connection with this theme um, with the hope that your confidence in the power of the gospel will grow even more. Let me, let me answer this question three ways. What can't stop the gospel? Let me tell you three things that can't stop the gospel. Number one, your lack of power. Your lack of power cannot stop the gospel. This ties back to our message even this morning. If you go to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, look at it again with me. Remember this. Jesus just says to them, you will receive what? Power. In other words, guys, you don't have it. You don't have it on your own. And that's just not a problem to me, Jesus could say. Because you're going to receive power when God the Father gives to me, God the Spirit, and I pour him out on you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and that's when you'll be my witnesses. Not on your own, not in your own ingenuity, not in your own power. And then just watch this. This, this is so important. I'm going to take you back through some very similar verses. Go back to chapter 4 and watch this. The apostles get in trouble in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. And they grab them and they pull them together. They place them in the middle of the religious leadership of Israel who's rebelling against all of this. In chapter 4, verse 7, watch this. When they, the religious leadership, had placed them, the apostles, in their midst, they began to ask them what? What's the first question? What does it say in verse 7? By what power? Do, Do the enemies know what's going on? Can they see it? It was tangible to them. These guys are operating by a power that we don't understand. So what is this power? By what power or in what name have you done this? A a guy gets healed. Where's this coming from? It's really pretty amazing. 
And so then Peter, look at verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them all that he said. And this is what he says in verse 12, there's salvation in no one else. That's kind of bold. I'm just going to let you guys know you're running the nation of people that are supposed to be the promised people. I'm just going to let you know there's salvation in no one else, no other name under heaven, given by which man must be saved. It's the name of the one that you've rejected. That's kind of bold. And they observed, verse 13, the confidence of Peter and John. And they comprehended that they were uneducated and ordinary men. They were marveling. This doesn't fit guys like this. We've seen uneducated men before. We've seen ordinary guys. And the kind of confidence and the kind of power that is coming out from them as they preach the gospel is something we haven't ever seen. This is amazing, they say. The enemies say this. Drop down to verse 29. They're praying when they're back together. Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your slaves may speak your word with all confidence. Confidence. I think that's a key word to go with, with power. And so then what happened? Look at verse 31. You remember this? When they had prayed earnestly, the place where they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to what? When they're filled with the Spirit, they open their mouths, and they've got confidence, and they proclaim the gospel. It doesn't matter if you don't have power. That can't stop the gospel because God has the power you need to proclaim the gospel. Yes. What else can't stop the gospel? Persecution can't stop the gospel. Persecution cannot stop the gospel. Let me just refresh your memory by going back to the very same verses. Go back to chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Look at this. As they were speaking to the people... The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly agitated because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day for it was already evening. What was the result? Look at the next verse. Did it, did it work? Did it squelch the gospel? Did it squelch everything when they persecuted them? Did that stop anybody from believing? What does it say? Many of those who heard the message believed. So persecution doesn't stop it. They they may beat you, they may imprison you, and yet still what is going to happen is people will hear the gospel and they will believe. Persecution can't stop the gospel. And the last one, as you saw this in chapter 4, verse 13, what can't stop the gospel? Your limited education. Your ordinariness. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. As they observed the confidence of Peter and John and comprehended that they were uneducated and ordinary men. Listen, they comprehended that. They could tell. Don't try to hide that. Don't try to act like you're some really, really smart theology professor somewhere. Like you've got it all nailed down. No, just be you. Just be you. It doesn't matter if you're not educated. It doesn't matter if you're ordinary because that's not the issue. They're not persuaded when you put on a facade of, I'm a smart guy in the room and I've got all the answers. You don't need to be that guy. Just be you. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter if you never went to college, mom, and you're just educating these little ones down by your feet. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how ordinary you are in the eyes of others. God has a way of working through that. Amen. And all of your disadvantages and deficits that you have. It can't stop the gospel. And I could give many more examples, but I'm not going to preach a two-hour sermon tonight. Maybe Wednesday night. Come back for that. <laughs> but let's pray. Let's give thanks. And you know what? I, want, want, I do need to finish with this. I do want to finish with this. The most important question for you tonight is has the gospel triumphed in your heart and in your life personally? Has it? Has the gospel triumphed in your life over your sin? The gospel is your only hope for forgiveness. The gospel is your only hope for God's just wrath against you being taken away. The gospel is your only hope for a righteousness that you are incapable of producing on your own. The gospel is your only hope for a new life to live in Jesus Christ. But you must repent. 
you must turn away from what you are and what you've made of your life apart from Jesus Christ. Believe him. and Believe his good news for you and you will be saved. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, would you take this truth and the power of your gospel and this good news and push it deep into each heart in the perfect way that only you can do. Apply your word with power in ways that uh, is for the good of the soul that is in desperate need of forgiveness of sin tonight. And do it for your glory so that everyone looking on that life forgiven and made righteous with you and given new life to live, that everyone would look and say, there is no man that did that, no woman that did that. That is you in your power in the gospel. And then you would be glorified. And Lord, that's what we want. And I pray, Father, that we would have greater clarity in our minds about what the mission is, about what the Great Commission is. Thank you for this message that must be preached. Thank you for the presence of churches that come out of the proclamation of the gospel. We pray for Brian and Kara even now, Lord, as they visit churches in Medang and consider the viability of strengthening one of those churches or planting churches that you, or planting a new church, that you would give them wisdom and that it would be inseparable from the preaching of the gospel. Comfort them, strengthen them, uphold them for this task, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.